So here you are again, standing at the edge of a pond, looking for a happy fish. Lo and behold, today you see one. There's a smiling fish in the water. You say, hey, yay, I found a smiling fish. That's great. But where you see that smiling fish isn't where the smiling fish actually is. Okay, you see the fish in a different position than we see the fish right now. Why? Well, as you saw yesterday with the little golf ball analogy, there's millions of rays of light reflecting off of that golf ball. There's millions of rays of light reflecting off of this fish. One ray of light goes up like this. When it strikes the boundary between the water and the air at a certain angle that we'll call theta 1, it refracts. Now, as it refracts, it's going to actually bend away from the normal line. The angle of refraction is going to be bigger than the angle of incidence because the light speeds up as it goes from the water into the air. So theta 1 becomes bigger than theta 2. We see this fish because we see this ray of light that was reflecting off of the fish. But our eyes and our brains aren't smart enough to recognize that, that ray of light bent when it struck the boundary between the water and the air. Our eyes and our brains think that that ray of light always traveled in a straight line. So we see this fish, but we see it in a different position. We see it further back, and we see it higher up, not quite as deep as the actual fish really is. Nevertheless, we see the fish. Now, for whatever reason, you back up now. You stand over here. That ray of light that was coming off of the top of the fish is still coming off the top of the fish, and it's still refracting in exactly the same way as it did before. But now we don't see it. If there's another person standing at the edge of the pond, he does see it. But you don't because you've backed up away from the edge of the pond. Now, it is entirely possible that there's another ray of light that you may see that bounces off of this fish. Okay, let's draw it like this. Okay, that ray of light bouncing off the top of the fish, it refracts like this into your eyes, which enables you to see it. The theta one that we just drew, the angle of incidence for the blue ray of light, is bigger than the angle of incidence for the green ray of light. If one of those angles, particularly the second one, the blue one, exceeds an angle that we call the critical angle, then we're not going to get refraction like we have drawn here. We're going to get reflection. In other words, that blue light that refracted into your eyes and allowed you to see this fish, albeit in a different position than it's really at, it doesn't refract at all. It reflects. And it never leaves the water. So what do you see as you stand back a certain distance away from this pond? You see the surface of the water. Why don't you see the fish? Because the ray of light that would be required to allow you to see the fish isn't leaving the water. It's bouncing off of the boundary between the water and the air. What do we call that? Total internal reflection, right? Total internal reflection is that phenomenon whereby light reflects as opposed to refracts. It completely reflects as opposed to partially refracting. It happens when we're going A from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction, water to air. It won't happen the other way around. You can't get it happening when you're going from air to water. You can when you're going from water to air. High to low index of refraction, if we exceed an angle that we call the critical angle, if theta 1 is bigger than whatever the critical angle happens to be. Now, how exactly do we find the value of the critical angle? Let's draw another little picture here. Here's my boundary between the two materials, whatever those materials are. Here's the normal line. We've got a ray of light that's coming down here. It's striking the boundary. It refracts. It speeds up as we go from a low to a high, sorry, from a high to a low index of refraction. If I increase that angle of incidence to a big enough value, then what happens is that ray of light actually skips along the boundary between the high and low index of refraction. 
This is the critical angle, the angle at which total internal reflection begins to occur. The angle of refraction that we're going to call theta 2 there, when total internal reflection begins to occur, is 90 degrees. So we're going to use Snell's law, sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals n2 over n1. But we're going to make theta 2 90 degrees. Becomes sine theta 1 or sine theta c, the critical angle, over sine 90 equals n2 over n1. This disappears because sine 90 is equal to 1. Sine theta c is equal to n2 over n1, or theta c, the critical angle, is equal to the inverse sine of n2 over n1. This equation is not on your data sheet. It's a specialized form of this equation, which is on your data sheet. You had a couple of questions to work on yesterday with that. Question 1, A, B, and C. Were there any issues with e any of these three questions, A, B, and C, on page 673? Notice the critical angle between A and B. Between water and air, it was 48.8 degrees. Between air and diamond, it's 24.4 degrees. The critical angle for diamond relative to air is about half the value of water compared to air. Talked about this yesterday in class. That's why diamonds sparkle. Because the critical angle is so small, it's much easier to exceed the critical angle. When it's easier to exceed the critical angle, you get more reflection taking place inside the diamond. And when you get more reflection taking place inside the diamond, you get more sparkling. That's why diamonds sparkle, and that's why water doesn't sparkle so much. Because the critical angle is much, much higher. Good with those questions? So good with those questions that you're going to be able to handle a few questions on worksheet number 17. Let's give it a try. All right, finish that worksheet up for homework, please. And we're going to move on to the stuff that we finished off with yesterday, the two kinds of lenses and the ray diagrams that go along with that. Just like with mirrors, we have both converging and diverging lenses. A converging lens, however, is a convex lens, as opposed to with a converging mirror, it was concave. A diverging lens is a concave lens, as opposed to a, con as a diverging mirror, which was a convex mirror. So the way these things work are real similar. Converging lenses have rays parallel to the principal axis converging at a focal point. Converging mirrors have rays parallel to the principal axis converging at a focal point. But we have to be careful that the shape of a concave mirror, sorry, converging mirror is opposite to the shape of a converging lens. We're going to usually use the terms converging and diverging because I always want to describe what's happening. Okay, what's the behavior of these lenses and mirrors as opposed to what do they look like? Yesterday, I asked you to draw a whole bunch of ray diagrams. This is a converging lens. Okay, it's bulged out in the middle. It's convex, but it's converging. If it was a mirror, it would be diverging because it's convex. It's, con it's uh, bulged out in the middle. There are five ray diagrams that we can draw for converging mirrors, or converging lenses, I should say. The first ray diagram is when I have that object well beyond twice the focal length. This is f. This is 2f. This is somewhere out beyond twice the focal length. The two rays that I'll always draw are like this. The first ray, parallel to the principal axis. It refracts down through the focal point. The second ray is going to go from the top of the object down through the optical center, and it's going to converge with the first ray on the right-hand side. It's going to converge right here. That produces an image that is what? Three characteristics here. It's smaller, good. It's inverted, good. And it's real. It's real, which means it could be projected onto a screen. Not that we have to, but it could be projected onto a screen. And we know that because it's solid lines that intersect. 
Next one. This time we have our object at 2f. The first ray is going to be drawn from the top of the object parallel to the principal axis, and it's going to go down through the focal point, just as it did in the last diagram. It's also going to go from the top of the object down through the optical center. And it's going to produce an image over on the right-hand side that looks like this. That image on the right-hand side is going to be inverted. It's going to be the same size as the object was. And it's going to be real. Inverted, same size, and real. I'm not sure exactly why you would use a lens to project an image, a real image, onto a screen that ends up being the same size as the object was. I'm not sure what the purpose of that would be. But you can do it. The next one that we draw has far more practical applications than the last two that we've drawn. Here we have the object that's in between f and 2f. The first ray will be exactly the same as the first ray that we drew for both of the other diagrams, parallel to the principal axis, down through the focal point. The second ray will be down from the top of the object through the optical center. It's going to look like this. The image formed is going to be on the right-hand side where these two solid lines intersect. The image characteristics are going to be larger, inverted, and real. Real because it could be projected onto a screen. We know that because it's solid lines that intersect. Where have you seen this before? Where are you seeing this right now? Yeah, it's the projector. The object that's inside this projector is in between the focal length of the lens and twice the focal length. So if the focal length of this lens is, I have no idea what it is, but let's say it's 10 centimeters, then the object, that is the little LCD object that's inside there, that's being projected onto this screen, would be somewhere in the range of 15 centimeters from the lens, somewhere between f and 2f. Now, how do we reconcile this whole upside down thing? It's a larger real image, which is exactly what we want on the screen. But the image that you see right now on that board isn't upside down. The projector is upside down, isn't it? Take a look at the ceiling. The projector is upside down. Now, you've seen these projectors right side up as well, and they produce the image that's right side up. You can actually electronically alter the image, so that, sorry, the object, so that the object can be flipped over while inside the projector. So the object is right now oriented along with the projector itself. You can press a button to flip it over so that you can put the projector right side up and still get the right side up image. Does that make sense? The object and the image always have to be on opposite sides of the principal axis. If you want the image to be right side up, and you want the projector to be right side up, then you have to make sure the object is flipped upside down electronically. This happens in a movie theater as well, right? The image that's formed on the screen is right side up. The image that's formed on a single lens would be, oh, sorry, the object that's formed before a single lens would be upside down. Let's try the next one. Parallel to the principal axis, down through the focal point, down through the optical center. Those two rays don't converge, so let's extend them backwards. We find that they don't converge over here as well. So what do we know about that image? There is no image. Good. Next diagram, you've seen this one a million times before as well. Maybe not quite as often, at least this year, as you've seen the one where we had the object in between f and 2f, i.e., the projector, but you've seen this one a bunch of times before. First ray parallel to the principal axis down through the focal point. Second ray down through the optical center. They don't intersect on the right-hand side, so let's extend them back. They intersect back here as dotted lines. That means the image is larger. It means that it's upright. And it means that it's virtual, so solid lines or dotted lines are intersecting 
which means that it could not be projected onto a screen. I've got to look into this lens in order to see the image. When do you look into a lens, a converging lens, and see an image that's right side up, that's larger, and that, of course, is virtual because you're looking into the lens? A magnifying glass. Right? A microscope has two lenses. So you do see that issue, you do see that in a microscope. Actually, it's upside down in a microscope, actually. Okay, it's reversed. Um, but you do see a magnified image, and it is virtual. But there's two lenses, so the, the ray diagram is a little bit tricky for that. Where do you see a single convex or converging lens producing an image that's virtual, larger, and upright? It's going to be in a magnifying glass. The lens that's in a magnifying glass is exactly the same as the lens that's in that projector. So the image is a lot different. Why? It's where the object is placed. If the object is placed in between f and 2f, we get the projector. If the object is placed inside of the focal length, between f and the, the lens itself, then we're going to get this larger upright virtual image. We're going to get the magnifying glass. Let's flip the page to the diverging lenses here. We had five of these. We'll draw two of them because they all end up being the same. The first ray in the first diagram goes parallel to the principal axis, and then it diverges away from the focal point. It goes away from this point right here that we call F. The second ray is going to go from the top of the object down through the optical center, and it's going to keep going straight through. Those two rays don't intersect. So what we're going to do is extend them backwards like this. First one goes back as an extension of where it refracted. The second one also goes back this way as an extension of where it refracted. They intersect right here. The characteristics of that image are that that image is smaller, it's upright, and it's virtual. You need to look in this lens in order to see it. If you continue drawing the ray diagrams for the rest of these objects in all the other four positions, you will find that the image will have the exact same characteristics as this is, does. The image will be a slightly different size and in a slightly different position, but it will always be smaller, it will always be upright, and it will always be virtual. We'll draw one more just to make sure you're okay with that. It's the other extreme, when the object is inside the focal length. The first ray is going to be drawn parallel to the principal axis, and then it's going to diverge away from the focal point. The second ray is down through the optical center. We extend both of them back. This one back to the focal point, this one back along the path from which it came. They intersect right here. You can see that that image formed is larger than it was the first time, but it's still smaller than the object. It's still upright, and it's still virtual. Every time you have a diverging lens, you will get a smaller, upright, virtual image. Is that good? This is my favorite slide for the entire year. My favorite slide to make for the entire year. And the reason that it's my favorite slide is because it's the easiest slide that I ever have to make this year. I showed you a slide earlier on, about a week ago, that said curved mirror math at the top. All I did was copy that slide, pasted it, and changed the word mirror to lens. It's the exact same thing. I taught you last week that there are two equations that apply for curved mirrors. There are two equations that apply for curved lenses as well. And they are the same two equations. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. m is equal to hi over ho equals negative di over do. The same sign conventions apply as well. DO is positive, always. Technically, it's positive when you have a real object, but for us in Physics 30, that's going to be always. DO is negative when you have a virtual object, but for us in Physics 30, that's going to be never. We'll never have a virtual object. 
So DO is always going to be a positive value for us, just like it was with mirrors. DI is going to be positive when it's a real image. And it's going to be negative when you have a virtual image. Sometimes you're going to have real, sometimes you're going to have virtual. F is positive when you have a real focal point. And it's negative when you have a virtual focal point. You have a real focal point when you have a converging when you have a converging lens. It's also positive when you have a converging mirror. You get a real focal point when you see the word converging, it's a real focal point. You have a virtual focal point if you have a diverging lens or a diverging mirror. Just be careful here. Converging mirror is concave. Converging lens is convex. We also have HO and HI. HO is positive when our object is upright. And it's negative when our object is inverted. HI is positive when we have an upright image. And it's negative when we have an inverted image. Finally, magnification is positive if the object and the image are both either right side up or upside down. When the object and the image are on the same side of the principal axis as each other, it's a positive magnification. When one is flipped over and one is right side up, then it's a negative magnification, just like it was with mirrors. Let's do one question. And then that's it for the day. This one says a 2.5 centimeter high object is placed 10 centimeters from a diverging lens. We see that word diverging. Let's circle it. We have an object height of 2.5 centimeters. It's so going to be HO, not DO. And we have a DO, an object distance of 10 centimeters. The focal length is 5, but we're actually going to make it negative 5 centimeters because we have a diverging lens. We want to find the image distance, di. We want to find the image height, hi. And then we want to find the attributes of the characteristics, which we'll just get from our answers, hi and di. We're going to use 1 over f, of course, is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. 1 over f, 1 over negative 5.0 centimeters equals 1 over 10 centimeters, plus 1 over di. We solve for di. Let's go through the same process as we had before in our calculators. Let's say negative 5 x to the minus 1. Let's subtract from that 10 x to the minus 1. Let's get negative 0.3. Let's flip that over. We get negative 3.333. So di is negative 3.333. Now technically, that's a final answer. So we'll record it just as our two digits, negative 3.3 centimeters. We're going to leave the unrounded number written down, though, in case we need it for the next part of the question. For that next part, let's say m is equal to hi over ho equals negative di over do. Scratch off the magnification part, because we know we're only going to use the last two parts of it. HI is what we're looking for. HO is 2.5 centimeters. That's equal to negative 3.333 centimeters, right? Good. It's negative negative 3.333, which makes it positive, over DO, which is 10 centimeters. HI is going to work out to be, I believe it was 0 0.83. Is that right? 0 0.83, and it's positive value. All my numbers are calculated now. Let's worry about the characteristics of the attributes now. Is it larger, smaller, same size? The object was 2.5 centimeters high. The image is 0 0.83 high. Is it larger, smaller, same size? It's smaller. Good. Is it upright or, or inverted? It's upright. We know that because HI is positive. And is it real or virtual? 
It's a virtual image. How do you know? Good, because DI is native. So it's smaller, it's upright, and it's virtual. Your homework for tonight is the remainder of the worksheet that I already assigned. Worksheet number 17, I believe it was. Worksheet 17. In addition, I want you to do, please, these three questions on page 681. We'll have ourselves a little quiz tomorrow on refraction, as long as that worksheet goes well for us. If not, then we'll deal with that tomorrow. That's it for today.